What's up, Charles? Hey, brother. How you folks doing out there? Let me just make sure my thing is up here, right there. Perfect. Let's see why don't I have any comments? Oh, oh, there we go. What's up, everybody? Aloha Friday, Nani. First on. <laughs> right on. Uh, how y'all doing, big guys? Mm. What a day. What a day. Hi, Patty. Guys, we got a great show for you guys tonight. I know it's still early. We come on early every time to make sure the stuff works. You know how that goes. What's up, George? James? I know I shouldn't start reading off names because I'm going to miss them because this thing scrolls really, really quick. Thank you, Nani. Our shirts, yeah. I put on a pink shirt tonight because, number one, I really love pink. Um, and it kind of keeps me subdued. So... Uh, It'll be a fun night tonight. We got, we got Dr. Uh, Lee Altenberg. I mean, he's been on our show before, but uh, he's going to be on tonight to share with us his analysis and his model uh, of, of what's going on right now. So he'll be on at 7 o'clock. But we just wanted to come on early and test the system. It works. And say hi and aloha Friday. How are you, Charles? I'm doing fine. Doing fine. I'm just... I'm having a real hard time just getting over the hump. It's Friday. And uh, I'm just enjoying my new role as being clueless. <laughs> Charlie. Charlie. Yes. You told me I have to be nice tonight. I'm being nice. I'm being okay. Nice. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, guys, 233 uh, cases again today. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about, uh, oh, my dad is on. Aloha, dad. Love you, man. Thank you for, I mean, it's late for a lot of you. Uh, West Coast, it's, it's almost 10 o'clock. East Coast, Essie, our wonderful, lovely friend from Florida who's on here uh, every night, all the way on the East Coast. We appreciate you guys so much. You don't even know. Uh, but we'll talk a lot about the cases. We'll talk about what's going on here in Hawaii. And um, I did want to, uh, what's up, George? We look, sh we're looking sharp, fuddly leakers. <laughs> all right, all right. Anyway, um, I, I did want to share a little bit about the, what I saw in the news tonight about one of the doctors uh, from one of the hospitals. Uh, very, 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 very concerned. Um, also, the doctor uh, from uh, HPH, uh, very, very, very concerned because unlike what the what the media or the or the or the leaders are telling us, unlike contrary to what we're being told, our hospitals are full. Heard it straight from the doctor's mouth, and it's filled with non-COVID patients. But every day, more COVID patients are coming in straight from the doctor's mouth. We don't know what we're going to do if this continues. Because last year at this time when, the, when there were two to 300 people in the hospital, COVID patients, remember then? Um, all of the elective surgeries, all of the non-emergency uh, procedures were, were canceled. So it opened up all the bids for COVID. Well, one year later, all of these people are in the hospitals recovering from their surgeries or their procedures. So the hospitals are full. And I think some of our friends that work in the medical community have been saying that for months now. You never heard that from the media. No, everything was all good, right? Everything was all, hey, the hospitals, we, only, only, only 24 people in the hospital, only 34 people in the hospital. Today is 70 some odd COVID patients. Well, uh, you're not counting the other non-COVID patients that take up capacity. So. I'm a little concerned, Charlie, and I know Dr. Uh, Altenberg will have uh, some, some thoughts on that, but uh, I'm concerned, and I think everybody should be, because it's not, and we talked about this, right? Remember one doctor we had on, I think it was Dr. Uh, uh, um, Murtaza, doctor, said, when you count the death rates or the death counts of COVID, you cannot just count 
the people that die of COVID. You got to count the people that are dying because they cannot get into a hospital or because the treatment was delayed, the conditions worsened. So, it, you know, it's, it's a much bigger than this sugar-coated message we get every day. It's serious, folks, and we got we to gotta pay attention. So that's, that's just my opening thoughts, sir. Well, you know. But who I, are we, Charlie? Who are we? Yeah, are you know, we? I want to comment on it, but I'm supposedly clueless. You know, folks, you're wondering why I'm saying that. It's uh, it's in honor of a clueless person that said we were clueless today. That's okay. Because all of you have taken that magical ride that we've been on. And I call it magical only because it helped all of us, including myself, how to be safe. Because if, it's, if you're not reminded, you can fall victim like those who are complacent nobody's reminding them because they don't want to be reminded and it's okay you go down that right route you think you're superman and the next thing you know you end up in a hospital and then you turn to uh wonder woman after that from superman to wonder woman so you have to be careful you have to know what we're playing with and again you know we, we have someone coming on that deals with numbers and you know, this guy's been pretty sharp. You know, I, I wish I had his talent, but he puts all these numbers together and he, and he builds models around around it. And one of those have been with regards to COVID. And and, and his modeling has been, with the numbers that he's, he's projected, has, has been, well, he, he admitted <laughs> to you, Mel, that he was way off, meaning he projected a little too low not thinking what, and he thought it was, he was high enough, but it went beyond that. Yeah. Well, he, um, he, he gave conservative numbers and, and, and he'll explain it more tonight. And, uh, and, yeah. and the, the timing could not have been better because uh, the professor of uh, mathematics at UH completed his study, which was put out today and I posted it on my site on my page, it was the, the Star Advertiser article actually. Uh, and this is who Dr. Altenberg works with. And so I'm sure he'll touch on that, but you'll see with more data that Dr. Altenberg had when he did his presentation a few nights ago on hawaiicovid.org, which we shared on the Hale Hawaii site. Uh, I know many of you saw that. And if you didn't, it's, you can go watch it again. It's on my page, it's on Hale Hawaii's page, but you'll see it tonight. And uh, we're just going to turn this over to him. He's going to share his screen. And, and please don't get, I know when I first saw the charts and the numbers and the, don't get flustered or intimidated by the, the numbers and the graphs. Listen to the message. The message is what's important. And understand that his numbers are based on the trends that we're seeing today. Uh, it could change, but based on the available data today, that's what we're going to hear tonight. So uh, fasten your seat belts and, um, and again, you know, uh, Charlie and I, clueless, uh, political agendas, you know, all that hogwash. Listen, we, Charlie and I search high and low for quality guests that can come on and share with you all. And us, we, we want to learn too. Um, aside from the, 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 the presentation that we saw a few nights ago, I haven't spoken to Dr. Uh, Altenberg since then, uh, except for the the invite on the email. So I'm, I'm just as uh, uninformed as all of you. So we're gonna, tonight is a treat. And, and just so you know, we're, we're also, we're getting Dr. T, Dr. Chupkovsky will be on next week. Uh, Dr. Uh, Miskovich, along with Harry Kim, huh, former Big Island Mayor will be on. That'll be interesting. That will be interesting. And we've got some other uh, exciting guests in store for you guys. So uh, we will be, continuing the Mel and Charlie show. We believe that, uh, the, the, you know, just, just a couple weeks ago, we didn't feel the need to be on three nights a week. I don't know if it's gonna be three nights, two nights, maybe four nights. It's gonna depend on what happens. And if the need arises, we will be on with guests that will bring you accurate scientific information. Uh, we hope you appreciate that. Well, I'd like to give a shout out to a good friend of ours, 
you know, this lady has been special like all of you. And she has gone over and beyond providing masks for many of our kupunas. She sent up a whole bunch to Kauai that uh, my lovely wife has given away during the food drive to those who needed a mask. Beautiful prints. So I want to say aloha and thank you to Ms. Patty Kawakami. Thank you for um, those kind words. And uh, we really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And, and Ms. Melissa Bolt, Bolton, who continues to uh, give away, give, give away with her own money, give away uh, PPE, yeah. uh, uh, disinfectant, lotion, things, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, we, we, again, we have been blessed. Charlie and I have been blessed with this new Ohana that we have, we have found. And oh, Dr. Altenberg is on. Uh, so we just want to just say thank you all. And uh, tonight in my closing comments, I have a very special message for you all uh, because I think, you know, I just want you all to know how much we appreciate you guys. So Charlie, let us yeah. bring in the doc. This would be a good time folks to share. I don't know where he went. I heard him ding. I heard him come in, but he's not here. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and share, guys. Share, share, share. Right now would be a good time to hit the share button. Yes. Uh oh, where did he go? No, he's there. there he's he is. All right. There. All right. Maybe my computer is. Uh, oh. No, he went outside to water the yard. There you go. That's right. Water, That's right. That's water right. in the yard. Well, for yeah. those of you that don't know, uh, Dr. Lee Altenberg is a theoretical biologist. <laughs> Theoretical biologist. Geez, I had a hard time pronouncing that. Um, he's a professor in the Department of uh, Information and Computer Sciences at UH Manoa. Numerous publications, guys. This is for those of you that uh, still believe we don't bring on experts, but he has numerous publications that you can find on the UH website. Just go, go to UH website, search his name, you'll see get, many of his publications are there that you can actually download and read. He's done a lot of work with COVID. In the last year and a half, he's been on numerous shows and podcasts and broadcasts and netcasts or whatever you want to call it. We are blessed, honored, and privileged to have Dr. Altenberg back on tonight uh, to share with us some very, information, some very important information. Doc, thank you so much for being with us, my friend. Thank you for inviting me. Aloha, Mel. Aloha, Charlie. Aloha to you, too. Well, Good. Doc, um, we, uh, many of us, on the show actually saw saw your presentation a very <laughs> abbreviated uh segment about five minutes i think maybe six minutes of uh your modeling that you did uh i understand that um, uh the professor of mathematics and i cannot remember his name i saw it in the newspaper article this morning uh released his information today but i wanted to bring you on doc turn it over to you no interference from Charlie and I. So you can share with us and our viewers what you and, and your, uh, your research has found and, and the trends. So uh, with that, sir, okay. I am turning this thing over to you. So I, I should mention that I think the study you're talking about is uh, Professor Monique Sheba in the mathematics department at UH Manoa. That's the one. And so they are doing a very detailed data intensive model that actually needs to run on a supercomputer to try to actually forecast what's gonna happen with the case numbers in Hawaii with this Delta variant. So um, the models that I'm gonna show are just very simple minded demonstrations because they don't have much data. But I think they still will il illustrate exactly you know, what happens with exponential growth uh, produced by by pandemics. <laughs> so um, I can share the screen then. Yep, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, sorry, sorry, I was muted. Yes, please. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. All right, so let me go through a little bit of introduction. So I'm going to give a little math lesson, okay, uh, which I'm very used to doing. And, and we're going to talk about the main uh, 
the main villain in this pandemic, which is called the reproduction number. So this is the main property you need to know to, what's, to know what's going on with, with your case numbers. And so the reproduction number is how many people that one infected person infects, okay? So R naught, this R sub zero, that's the reproduction number at the start of the pandemic when there was no mitigation and no immunity. And however, when lot, lots of things change uh, in time, that number, the reproduction number will change and that is given by R sub T, which is just the reproduction number at any time T. And that's given masks, vaccines, immunity, everything. And the key thing is that if RT is greater than one, which means that one infected person will infect more than one other person, then the infections grow in number in time. So let's, let's review the pandemic in Hawaii so far as a story of R, as a story of the reproduction number. So here is the very beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020. So this is March through May, the first three months and COVID arrives here and it starts growing and it's growing exponentially and throughout the month of March. And we can, we, we can pick an exponential curve. So an exponential curve, that's like your interest rate or inflation rate, uh, or you know when they talk about the growth rate uh, of the stock market. Uh, so it's like compound interest. So to get a growth rate that was this fast, and this assumes that every 5.3 days, an infected person infects the next person, you have to have an R naught of 2.2, which is to say every initial person who was infected with COVID in Hawaii was infecting around 2.2 other people. And it produced this exponential growth rate. Well, look how bad it got. It was like the maximum was about, was less than 40. And remember today we had 233 cases recorded. So at that point, Governor Ige instituted the, the first stay at home order. So this is, nobody knew what was gonna happen with this pandemic. It was fresh around the world and the stay at home order immediately drops the cases down and we can fit an exponential curve to that, which is exponential decay. And this comes out to RT being 0.66. So it went from 2.2 down to 0.66. So that's a 70% reduction in the reproduction number. So that is a, in a sense, a demonstration of what a stay at home order can do here in Hawaii. And if it had stayed like that, the, basically the pandemic would have gone extinct. But uh, also, um, <laughs> if everybody's locked in their house, the economy is going to grind to a halt. So that's an impossible thing to maintain for, forever. But it did work to bring the case numbers down. So let's go on into June um, on, through October of last year. And after the stay-at-home order ended, we saw the cases inching up. And this RT was about 1.2. Now, after the 4th of July, there was just a little bump here. I don't know if you can see that. I'll show a close-up to that. But it was towards the end of July that the, the case numbers really started picking up. And during this period, the reproduction number was about 1.7. So this is what happens when every infected person infects about 1.7 other people. And we got up to 200 cases a day that way. Now, something happens here around early August and the numbers don't keep going up at this, at this explosive rate. They go up at a much more gradual rate. And during this period, it looks like RT is about 1.1. So there was no, you know, there was no essential, there was no emergency, new emergency measures. So something happened here and people changed their behavior and they were being more careful. 
probably alarmed by how by how fast the numbers were growing in this period. And again, uh, when this change happened was about when the case numbers per day uh, hit about where they are now. And but still the numbers kept going up and up and finally they were they were they reached about 350 in a single day, even at this lower rate of 1.1, that's still exponential growth. So then Governor Ige uh, declared the second stay-at-home order and immediately, so this only lasted two weeks, but immediately the case numbers plummeted in half and this RT was about 0.54. So again, uh, this is something like about a 60% drop in the reproduction number produced by the second stay-at-home order. So it works and it's a, it's a last resort that has worked in the past if things really get out of control. But after the stay-at-home order ended, people didn't go back to the, the RT 1.1. They didn't go back to any of these earlier rates. They actually went, they w became careful enough that the RT had dropped below one. So this is what people are talking about is supposed to happen when you reach the herd immunity threshold. That's when this reproduction number is less than one and the, the numbers decline. Now here they're declining very slowly so that over the course of early September to late October, oh, they bear, it looks like they dropped maybe 20%, 30% from in the daily cases. So when RT is just a little bit below one, it takes a long time to get their numbers down and you have, and you have a long duration of high, uh, high numbers if you started at a high number. Now, if, if the governor's stay at home order had gone three weeks instead of just two weeks, this, this line might've started much, much lower down here and, and if it had done the same thing. But I think the crucial lesson here is this is, this is how, what the people of Hawaii have been able to do with this pandemic, all right? And so here, during this period, there was no stay-at-home order, um, but people were able to lower it substantially from 1.7 to 1.1 just by being more careful. And then after the stay-at-home order, people got really careful and they actually dropped it to, to what the herd immunity threshold would bring us. Now, when you talk about the herd immunity threshold, that's the reproduction number being less than one when you're not doing any mitigation me measures whatsoever, when you're not doing masks, social distancing, quarantine, contact tracing. Well, if you drop everything and RT is less than one, that's what the herd immunity threshold will give you. So here the RT got less than one, but it took a lot of people being careful, social distancing, uh, wearing masks and all of these things, but it was possible. So, but this is with the old, the original SARS-CoV-2 variant. And the one that's dominant here now, the Delta variant, which evolved from millions of people being infected and then mutations of the virus, changing it in random ways, one of which discovered that it could be twice as contagious, estimated to be 2.25, two and a quarter times as contagious as the original strain. So during this period here from September through October of last year, if this had been the Delta strain, RT would not have been 0.96, it would have been about two, over two. So that would have been faster than any of these other periods, it, it would have been growing at the rate that, that uh, the COVID cases were growing at the beginning of the pandemic, all right? So even people being careful during this period, if it had been the Delta variant here instead, we would have exploding numbers. So this is the problem that the Delta variant is, is giving us, all right? The measures that we took before that would have kept the reproduction number below one wouldn't work with the Delta variant. Okay, so let's look at where we are now with the RT. So here, 
if you look back at around June 20th, the numbers started going up. So in the newspaper, people have been blaming the current I numbers on the 4th of July gatherings, but they started going up before that. And this is around the time that Delta started to increase in numbers in Hawaii. And so if we, if we just calculate the RT based on this growth, we get 1.45. So this is somewhere in between what it was um, in a year ago, in July a year ago, and then in August a year ago. It's in between there. And, but this, uh, so I, I, I should make a note here. So I say the apparent RT because it's different now from last year because you have travelers getting here and there are lots of travelers that are not getting quarantined that just arrive and uh, are free to move around. And uh, as we see, there's a share of the infection among those travelers. I mean, that's how Delta got here in the first place. Delta didn't even exist a year ago, as far as anybody knows, but infected travelers brought it here and then infected the residents. And I'll have a little bit more to say on that because, you know, supposedly the Safe Travels program is supposed to be keeping infection out of the state. It's supposed to stop travelers, infected travelers from getting here, but obviously it's not working. Otherwise, if it were working, we wouldn't have Delta variant here. We wouldn't have had the UK variant before it or the Brazilian variant before that. They all got here despite the safe travels program. And um, so with the, the influx of infected travelers, we can't be sure that this number is just the local, the local uh, reproduction number and among residents because it's getting amped up by some unknown number of infected travelers. But this is what it apparently looks like is 1.45. Now let's compare that to the original Delta wave in India where it, when the Delta variant first exploded into world prominence. If we do the exponential fit to their numbers, to their case numbers, we get RT 1.4. So that's less than what we are showing right now since June. And what happens when you have RT 1.4 for 54 days in a row? You started, they started out with 16,838 cases a day at the beginning of March. And by late April, they ha were having 350,000 cases a day. So this is what happens if this exponential growth just keeps going and going and going. And this is 54 days of it. So what do we had here? Uh, this is, looks like about 30 days. So most of, so 30 days of this exponential growth in India, oh, it only got us to, a, got it to about here. Oh. And it was the next, couple of weeks where it, it just, where the numbers were overwhelming. So uh, we don't want to keep this exponential rate going. And uh, so in today's news, the Lieutenant Governor said, you know, basically chill out for the next couple of weeks. And I think that's very, very sage advice. Essentially what we need to be doing is, you know, so I mean, this, the stay-at-home order, people did it voluntarily. I mean, they, there was some enforcement, but you didn't need to be, have everybody uh, have a guard at everybody's door to make sure they did it. People just did it. And when they were, when they were told, um, mandated by the government to do it, and, and looks what it did, it brought the numbers down very fast. And so this is something that we, can, we are capable of doing now without a governor's mandate, without an emergency order, uh, if we just decide to do it, we can stop these, stop these numbers from growing. So um, now let's, I'd like to look at, um, compare right now to how it was a year ago. 
So a year ago, this blue line, we saw this slow increase and then here's 4th of July and it did a bit of an uptake for about a week and then it came down a little bit. And, but then it was late July when the, no, when the numbers really started to climb. So this is not connected to the 4th of July. It's, it's probably more just connected to people wanting to see each other again and meet in person. And, you know, maybe, maybe the 4th of July gave, a pe it gave people a taste for how nice it was to, to, to gather together again, and then they continued to do it. But that's, that's when we saw last year, saw the, the big increase. But here we are, two, 2021. Here's the case numbers in orange. And so the 4th of July, yeah, it starts to go up a little bit, but it keeps going up. It doesn't get this drop that it did last year. It just keeps going up. So this is really concerning. This is quite alarming. Um, and this, mind you, is in spite of 60% of the population being fully vaccinated. So this is the power of Delta. So er everything that we had planned and th thought was going to bring an end to the pandemic under the old variants is thrown out the window because Delta is twi over twice as contagious as the original variant, and it's 50% more contagious than the, the UK variant, which is called Alpha. They, they've renamed all the variants instead of giving them geographic names, they give them just Greek letters, like, like when there's too many hurricanes. And, um, and so the UK, the Alpha variant, um, this Delta is 50% more contagious than that was. So now let's, let's do a little bit of algebra here. So here's this estimate that 2.25 times as transmissible as the original SARS-CoV-2 variant. That's the Delta variant. So if we use the R naught for, for Hawaii, which was 2.2 back in March of 2020, that gives our R naught of Delta to be about five here in Hawaii. So, but we're 60% vaccinated. And, and another 10% uh, likely are immune because they got COVID. So there's actually only 3% in terms of cases, only about 3% of the population have had positive tests for COVID. But the, the, the tests are catching maybe a third of the actual infections. So that's an estimate. So multiplying that by three gives us an estimate of 10% of the population that's had COVID. And so if you add that to the 60% vaccinated, that means 70% of the population should be immune to COVID. And so what difference does that make with this R, R not so high? So let's just do multiply the numbers together. And if we take the R not of Delta, take the number that are not immune that are left over times the Delta factor, we get it still has an RT of 1.5. So even with our vaccination, 60% vaccinated, RT of Delta is still greater than one, which means if we dropped all of our precautions, uh, it would grow, the, the case numbers would grow like they did back in, um, well, actually, they'd grow faster. They would grow faster than what uh, Delta did in India. Okay. So here, um, let's see. Okay. So it's a real problem. Delta is a real problem for all of our mitigation measures. And here is a little slide from that, from Professor Sheba's uh group uh that um it's uh, done in collaboration with high pam which is the hawaii pandemic applied modeling work group uh of which i'm a member and this uh this slide is too it's too um hard to read all of the uh all the labels but over on this side this is the worst case prediction for honolulu and 
the case numbers in Honolulu today are already higher than that worst case prediction. And I think this should give us pause. So next I'll go do a little demonstration of what these exponential numbers do, but let me, let me pause here. Uh, awesome. Have any comments or thoughts before I go to the demo, Al? I'll change that. Well, Doc, let me uh, ask you, uh, given this, this display up to this point, and I know you can't ask, answer for any of the administration, present administration, why do you think they're allowing it to continue the way it's continuing with no, it, it seems like there's no mitigation other than uh, vaccination. And, and it's quite clear, it's quite clear as evidence you, you've shown that um, this variant is finding ways around the blockades, sort of speaking. Why do you think our, our administration is just allowing it, it and I asked this question last night when Mel and I were just the two of us, because it, it sure seems as if they're gonna let it go until it dies out on its own, but it doesn't, um, that's my concern. It doesn't seem like it's dying out on its own. Definitely not. Um, so I, you know, I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes with the administration. Um, I do know that, uh, um, so, I mean, what do we have in place now? We have, there's certain limitations on gatherings, on size of groups, and, and we have the mask mandate for indoors. Uh, those, um, did I miss any? Mm -hmm. Those are the main ones I think we have. Well, um, the, you know, so, some of the, I mean, uh, you know, like on Oahu, your, uh, the capacities were increased. Uh, as far as bars and restaurants and uh, and in, in a lot of these locations, it's physically impossible to keep six feet separation because of the, obviously the size of the building. So Oahu, I'm a little concerned about because of the gatherings and, and, the, and the establishments that are allowed to, to uh, maximize their capacity. Uh, and of course, they, you know, you got to have a vaccination card, but so, but, but besides that, and, and of course the masks and stuff, there, there really isn't any uh, mitigation. I mean, a, the strong push is for vaccines and we know that's really what it's gonna take. But as we move forward, and, and I guess we should wait for you to do the demo so we can actually see the numbers, but it's, I guess the question Charlie asked is my question is, it, it, this variant, there's no indication that this variant will go away if, uh, if nothing changes. No, it's here, and and as long as that reproduction number is greater than one, it's not going away, and and it's reproducing so fast, so that um, it's sweeping through unvaccinated local populations, and um, you know, so it's it's going to rapidly get to people. So um, let me let me do my share here and go to the let's see here the demo. We have the demo on the on the screen. Uh oh, he's frozen. Oh no. Sir, I'm gonna have, to, I'm not finding it. Let me, um, let me pause this for a sec. And um, we're seeing the demo screen on the, on the screen. Oh, you are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see here. Okay. Um, Forgive me for a little bit of technical slowdown. Um, Clear the screen. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you're gonna you're gonna try to go back into it on a share. Yeah. So yeah. so I don't know. You know, I don't know what they're thinking of doing. Um, clearly, the current the current mix of things is producing this explosive growth in cases. So something has to change. So indeed, people uh, if people just stop bumping into each other. Um, to the extent that they can, will reduce the, the, the infections quite a bit. Um, let me ask you, let me yeah. ask you something. Tom, yeah. and, and I'm sorry to interrupt you on that. Um, you know, I took a look at the airport today, just looking at the, the great numbers, the influx coming in and going out. The numbers, like on, say, for Kauai, has seemed enormous. I mean, it, it's to the point that there's just not enough room on the sidewalks at the airport. It's just that many people. So not saying that they're infected, but there's got to be a high degree of those that's where this virus is hiding amongst, right? Because, you know, we've talked about it before that, you know, everyone uh, that's, that, that's put out the message that, you know, we've got community spread, community spread, and we're saying, wait a minute now. Let us try to take care of the community spread first, but if you just keep on bringing it in, it's almost like when the community spread is taken care of and it goes down, more gets added to the mix and then the, the kettle starts filling up again. You know what I mean? And that's what it seems like. Am I? Am I? So, yeah. So there's kind of two different situations. If, if we've gotten the, the reproduction number below one mm -hmm. and, and, and you cut off all the travelers from coming in, the pandemic would go extinct here. It would disappear in a mat just a matter of time. But when you have, even under that situation, but if, if you have a steady influx of tourists, then they're gonna keep reseeding the infection. So, um, so I, I, I use this metaphor of, of a, a pile of straw, okay? Or maybe think of a, of a grassy field and there's a fire. There's a fire and you're getting a storm of embers, hot embers flowing down. Okay. And so if, you, if you've like watered down the grass, then each of those embers will land and maybe burn a little bit of grass, but then it's wet and it'll go out. And so that that's not so bad if it's if it's a nice wet field but if it's just barely moist and each and each ember say can burn like a little area around it of straw and that burns a little area then and you have this steady raining down of firing em embers you can still lose a lot of of your field to get burned mm -hmm. but now if it's dry and that first ember lands and it starts a fire and that just keeps growing and then you get a brush fire. So that dry, that dry situation is when your reproduction number is greater than one. Now, so there you're gonna get a fire even if you just had one infected traveler that brought it in. So in between all those cases, you'll get some blend. And I think that's where we are now. So, let me go now. I found the share, and let's see if this will. There we go. Okay. You see it? You see the share? Yes. So this was a headline in KHON uh, back in March, and it said, "New study says testing similar to safe travels may detect nearly ninety percent of travelers with coronavirus." Okay, and that. Um, was in the press quite a number of times and gave people the idea that the safe travels was really keeping us safe. But that headline is wrong. Okay, what it got wrong is that 90%, that was how many, um, how many people on the plane you've kept off who would have been infecting people on the airplane. So when you do the, 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 tra the safe travels test three days before traveling, and then you block all the people that are testing positive, when everybody gets on the plane, that will have reduced the number of people that were infectious on the airplane by 90%, 88% is what the study said. 
but they're still um, 64% of the infected people are still on the plane, but they weren't detected by the test and they aren't infectious at the moment because the, the virus is incubating in them. But when they get to Hawaii and, and arrive at their hotel and go out to restaurants, that virus then is started to reproduce and then they become contagious. And so if you look at how many people become contagious after they get here, then over a two week period, the safe travels, the pretest would reduce that number only by 36%. So in other words, if you, if you had no safe travels program at all and people were just freely coming here and then you decide that wasn't any good and so you start testing people, that's only gonna reduce the amount of infection that we're getting from travelers by 36%. 64% are still getting through. And when I took a closer look at that paper, actually the number is closer to 80%. So that means there's only a 20% protection that the safe travels uh, pre-test is providing people. So that's, um, that, you know, that kind of reminds me of, I don't know, back in the 80s, everybody was putting these big cardboard sun, sunshades in their front of their cars with various messages on it and said like, you know, warning, you know, or, you know, call 911 or something like that. One of them said, warning, this car protected by a large piece of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, to, to me, is what the situation is with safe, safe travels, you know, warning, uh, you know, 20% of infected people will be blocked by the safe travels test. Um, so, you know, the, have, the, the yeah. problem has always been, and, and, and you hit the nail right on the head, Doc. The, the, the problem has always been with that messaging. There was no way of validating what they were saying when got challenged. That was the problem. So it was like they put it out there. So, hey, it was very hard to find out, you know, their source, where it's coming from, yet they're putting out these numbers. And then we have individuals like you that come on before that kind of pinpointed certain numbers that kind of opened our eyes even a little bit more. I said, hey, wait a minute. Then we have other noted doctors chiming in with the same position that you're taking now. I mean, we could have, it, it, basically what you're saying at this point, if, if safe travels were a true safe travel program, we could have stopped this way before, right? Yes, oh. absolutely. Yeah. So if you look at the numbers before they started climbing in late June, they were, they were going down at about R, RT of about 0.95. And that was with a dominance of the UK variant, the alpha variant, which was 50% more contagious than the original one. So with, with the level of vaccination that we had then and the care that people were taking, we basically had beat the, 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 the alpha variant. And now the Brazilian, the P1 variant was gaining strength. And it's hard, it's hard to know exactly how that compares with Delta, but Delta seems to be crushing the, 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 the Brazilian variant uh, wherever they've mixed together. Mm. So, um, so all of our measures were pretty much working on, on everything that was as contagious as the alpha variant, the UK variant, mm -hmm. but, but they're no longer working with Delta. And so it's a new, it's a new ball game, all right? Um, it's like uh, our team was, you know, was playing the minor leagues and suddenly uh, we, have to, we have to play the, the national champions. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, Guess what? We got to we got to change our game. <laughs> um, so, so a, a real problem is okay. The press, the press, and the government. These are like Hawaii's brain, if you want to if you want to talk like that. And there was something the press was not working, because if you look at all the stories about the variants, none of them mention how you know how did they get here, how did they get here through the safe travels program. Nobody was asking that question in any of the local press. And then when you see, saw the studies about the safe travels program, you know, should it be 
change this way or change that way. Nobody was mentioning the variants. It was kind of like, you know, the two parts of the brain were not allowed to talk to each other. And, and nobody was asking hardball questions when these variants were getting here, like how did they get here? When they, when they spoke to the different government, government officials, nobody was saying, hey, how did these variants get here if the safe travels program is working? So I don't know, I don't know what was behind that. I mean, it seems like the obvious question to ask. So we, we don't know, did the, did the reporters just never think to ask that? Or did they think, well, if I ask that, that might seem a little impertinent. Uh, it might seem a little too hardball. I don't know. But whatever it was, the, the, public, the public was done a disservice by not probing that question. And the real problem is, you know, with our tourists, our dependence of our economy on tourism, it's like 25% of all of our economic activity has to do with tourists. And we can't change that overnight. There's a, there's a discussion about how to lessen the dependence on tourism that the economy has. And certainly a lot of the efforts of the University of Hawaii have been to diversify the economy, to bring in um, tech, you know, te uh, technological industries and to lessen that um, basic that dependence on tourism, but we are we are stuck with that now, and so we really had to get visitors coming back. But obviously, the the safe travels program wasn't working to keep uh, infections out of Hawaii. So the problem is when you say it's working and it's not, that shuts down conversation. It shuts down a probe for alternatives that would work, that would let people in, that would let people into the state. Um, but not the infection. And so two our ideas that were um, tossed around, well, one of them was if you could somehow quarantine travelers to the outdoors because the infection, the chance of infection is much less in the outdoors than it is indoors. So the problem with, with coronavirus is it's just in what, just when you breathe out, you produce these microscopic little, little particles of water and little bits of, of, the lung, um, of the lung fluid. And when you're infected with COVID, those are full of viruses and they just go in, they just float in the air, just like cigarette smoke. And so six feet of distance is not gonna help you if you're in an enclosed space that that, that, that floating aerosol can't escape from. It's just gonna fill up the room and, and anybody in the room can get infected. So, um, so the, the whole six feet, incantation is not going to protect you when the whole room is filled with aerosol. So really ventilation is, is a really critical thing. And you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's a shame that people are enclosed in, in windowless air conditioned boxes in a, in, a, in a place where the outdoors is as beautiful as it is in Hawaii and where the air is as fresh as it is. And so Anything you can do to connect, reconnect with the fresh air uh, will help to prevent aerosol of COVID to, from building up in your room. And um, so um, let me, so the, the problem is, so that was, so that, so that was one a remedy uh, is to just keep, people outdoors for the first few days that they've arrived and then retest them. But the other, the other remedy is just to require tests um, like every other day for, for the first 10 days after all travelers have, have arrived here. So they can move about freely um, without any kind of quarantine restrictions, but, but you have regular testing to see if and when they become infectious. So if, if that had still been on the agenda, if anybody had noticed that the Safe Travels program wasn't working to keep out these variants, then there might've been a bigger push to, to bring up some other kind of uh, method that would have kept out the variants. But, but uh, when you have the government saying it's working and it's keeping us safe and there's no uh, cases of any consequence coming from travelers, that shuts down the search for something better. And that's where we are now. 
and um, and and so as the as the number of infections go up on the mainland, the number of infections from travelers is going to go up, and the number of of residents infected by travelers is going to go up, and we still don't have any solution. So this is something to consider. So let me go um, and run this demo. So this is an exponential growth demo. So it's not a full epidem epidemic model. It's not a forecast, but it's basically showing if certain conditions hold, what is the result? And I think it's instructive to look at that. So let's go. So here I have some numbers I can put into it. And then, so these are the if statements. And then I hit the hit the carriage return, and then we saw we see the then statements. So let's put in our current vaccination rate of 60%. And the estimated number that have been that are immune because of they've been infected with COVID at 10%. And then we put in our, our delta factor and all of these numbers together and put in today's number of cases, 233. And let's look what happens over the next uh, 30 days. <laughs> all right, this is a, a horrendous scenario. So this gives us an RT of 1.485 and which is about the, the calculated number right now. And in the end of 30 days, it would, if it kept up, we'd be getting over 2000 cases a day. All right, so clearly we, we are not gonna get anywhere near that number before some, before some steps are taken to try to stop it. So that's, a, that's what Delta does when we're already 60% vaccinated. Okay, so, so this is the real, Delta is a real nemesis. It's a real problem. And, um, and this is not even talking about, so some parts, of, some parts of the island, some local areas have like 40% vaccinated. And if we put in, say, put in that vaccination rate, and let's suppose the, um, the number of infected in a, in, a, in a local community was, let's put a smaller number, let's put in, say, just a 40, okay? and see what happens with the local community if it doesn't get vaccinated. All right, then here the numbers are even more horrendous. Okay, just starting with 40 cases in a community that's 40% vaccinated, at the end of 30 days, we're getting over 6,000 cases a day. So this is clearly not, we're, we wouldn't allow things to get anywhere near this. We would get some kind of a, some kind of a, um, further restrictions. We would go back lower on the tier system, or if it got bad enough as a last resort, have to do another stay at home order. But this is what the, the Delta has the power to do in a community that has only 40% vaccinated. So let's, so here's that 60% level. And we get this curve. If we, that's starting with 400. So let's start with the actual number today, uh, excuse me, with 40, let's start with our 233. And then we get the, this case growth rate. So, but there's already another 5% in the pipeline that have gotten their first shot. And so what happens when that 60, when that extra 5% brings us up to 65 <clears throat> after getting the second shot? Here it's a much, much better situation but still not good enough. We're still, we're starting here at 233 and in 30 days we have, we have more than 700 cases a day. So that's still not good enough. There still needs to be <clears throat> some kind of additional mitigation measures beyond if we only get to 65% vaccinated. But let's get us to that 70%. So Governor Ige said, if we got to 70% of the population vaccinated, that he would drop all restrictions. And uh, Lieutenant Governor has emphasized the governor's EGA's commitment to drop all restrictions at a 70% vaccination rate. And by golly, at this rate, 
the numbers start to slow, come slowly down. And if you look at what RT is, it's 0.99, just a smidge under one. And that's, that's what it takes to get the numbers to decline. Okay, so that looks pretty good. But this model doesn't include the infected travelers. Okay, this is as if we were entirely a closed population. But the problem, but the problem is when you're talking about herd immunity, the herd immunity threshold, that's always conceived as applying to a closed population that's not getting a steady influx of infected people. So down here, we can add an, the steady influx of infected travelers. So let's start again. Let's go to 70% vaccinated and suppose there's just 10, 10 infected travelers infecting local residents a day. All right, that's not a lot given that, what's our number of travelers today, per day, it's like 30,000? Yeah, about 30, 30, 35,000 a day. Okay, so suppose out of that 35,000, there's only, the residents are only getting infected, 10 people getting infected by travelers. So plug it in and run the, run the model. And so the RT is still <clears throat> below one, except the numbers keep going up. So this is what happens if you just have if, if the residents are getting 10 infections from travelers a day, just, just 10, the numbers don't go, stay flat. 70% vaccination rate is not enough to get the numbers down. They still go, keep going. And after 30 days, they're up to about 500 a day. So suppose it was like 20, suppose the numbers on the mainland really go up. Suppose it was 20 infected travelers a day. Then at 70% vaccination rate, you're still getting almost 800 infections a day in 30 days. So that's clearly not good enough. So this, this 0.99, RT of 0.99, which is the herd immunity threshold, that's not good enough when you have infected travelers coming in, even if it's just 20 infected travelers a day. So what, how, how, how do you have to get the vaccination rate to deal with that? Well, let's put it up to 0.74 and see what happens. That's still growing. Let's bump it up to 0.75. Still growing. Let's go a little bit, six. Still growing. Any numbers you want me to try? <laughs> yeah, try, try 0.8. Okay, give it 0.8. Ta-da, <clears throat> we finally start getting the numbers down when we have 20 <clears throat> infected travelers a day at point at 80% of the population vaccinated. Now, what if it's 40 infected travelers? Suppose it's really getting bad <clears throat> on the mainland. And that means that your, vac um, your number of 0.8 would have to be in a range of 0.9 if you're going that route. Well, so 0.9, because if we already count, <clears throat> if we already count the 10% the that are immune from having been infected, that's going to, that's going to drive it to zero. So this, it's not even, a, it doesn't even show up on the chart. <laughs> Let's, if we back that's off. We wanna be, right? That's where we want to be. <laughs> yeah, that's where we want to be, definitely. So <laughs> here we go. Just a little, if it's 0.89, then say we have 40 infected travelers a day at 0.89, we, we end up with 100 cases a day. Mm-hmm. And so it's really, really sensitive around the, this threshold, this herd immunity threshold. And um, so why would it, you know, with this information you're providing, I mean, it's very stunning in and of itself. Why wouldn't someone in a position, doesn't have to be at the top, but someone say legislatively that can talk some sense, looking at what you're putting, why wouldn't you want to, use something like this because it's, it's like a battle plan, right? If, yeah. if six travels were to use this as their battle plan to promote their program, they would have a goal to work towards to, to keep these numbers the way it is. Then I can see us staying open. But right now it's, it's almost like we're, we're going into this blindly with, with no 
with no evidence that they want to release that they're looking at numbers on uh, seriously. Well, you know, there's an old saying that no battle plan survives the first encounter with the enemy. Mm -hmm. right, have you heard that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So well, you, you know, Doc, <clears throat> this, you know, and, I, and I'll, you know, Brian Engel's one of one of our viewers. Uh, he's a statistician, mathematician. For a very long time, his prediction on herd immunity here was well over 80%. Um, many of the experts across the country uh, with the variants all of a sudden changed their uh, theories from 70% uh, to upwards of 90% to reach herd immunity. So this is not, this is, I mean, this is as, it, they cannot say they didn't know. Uh, I don't, I don't think they saw a model like this, but I think it was pretty clear and evident throughout experts uh, that in fact, with the variants and the way the variants were multiplying, that you couldn't rely on the 70%. That it was, in fact, I saw some estimates upwards of 93% uh, to reach herd immunity. So we knew that. And it's just, uh, this information is not being made available to the public. So the sense of uh, uh, security, I guess, whether it's a false sense of security is that these people are hearing is that, hey, it's okay. Uh, we know the immunity uh, issues. We we know, but again, the messaging has been has been pretty conflicting, and and I think that's where we are having problems. A lot of people are dropping their guards, uh, and 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 doing more gatherings and not wearing masks because they believe it's safe. And I I don't know how to get this message or this this type of information across to the decision makers. We you know the the image that comes to my mind is. I don't know if you remember Alien, the movie Alien. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so this poor guy, this poor astronaut has this alien is on his on his face. You know, it's it's attacked him and it's it's grabbed onto his face and they don't I know how to get it off. And finally it drops off. And they think, wow, it's it's gone. And so they're all back at breakfast and having a great time at breakfast. And um, so they think life is back to normal. And then the guy, suddenly the guy gets some indigestion and suddenly it's like, oh my God, he's writhing. And then he's writhing on the table. And the next thing, the alien pops out of his chest. <laughs> right? Things were not all back to normal. And, and I see the Delta variant is like that alien, the chest burster. All right, we thought everything was back to normal. We, it was breakfast in Hawaii and boom, the numbers burst out of, out of the, the graph like the alien out of the chest because Delta is a different virus. It's only just a few mutations, but they were crucial mutations to make it vastly more contagious. And so a, a recent paper sh shows that it people that are infected with it seem to produce a thousand times more virus product from their bodies than the old, the original variant did. And so it's just like, um, you know, you used to be setting off firecrackers and now you have a whole, a whole factory spewing out smoke um, in comparison to the old variant. So that's, so something, the virus has done something so that it can get in and just crank, crank up the manufacture of the virus that a person's body does and to vast amounts. And it seems to become infectious sooner. And that's probably a part of it uh, after being infected. And uh, some studies show that it, it, it has a much higher hospitalization rate. So it's like, a, it's a different ball game. And, um, and so everything has to be revised. Okay, and, and how, I mean, when once we saw back in March what Delta variant was doing in India, it was clear that the um, the scenario, you know, breakfast, it's the pandemic is over. Let's you know go back to normal. It wasn't going to happen. And just exactly how far we were going to get thrown off of that, nobody knew. So I should mention so again: these these models are very sensitive to the particular numbers, but I don't know these numbers exactly. So I put in a I put in a a delta a RT of five, okay? But there's other estimates that make it seven or even higher. It's, it's, it's now one of the most contagious diseases ever known to humanity. There's only a very few like measles that are much more contagious. So, um, 
So it's a it's a new it's a new disease in terms of its its mathematical properties. Let's put it that way. And so we really have to we have to let go of our hopes and um, our plans that that made sense before it came along because it's here now. It's different. It's changed. And so I don't know. I have no idea what what their discussions are in the health department or in the governor's office or the lieutenant governor's office, but um, they are, I mean, they're noticing it. So um, Lieutenant Governor Green's um, Facebook um, message today, he, he, he was substantially alarmed at the numbers. Um, so, you know, he said, what the, <laughs> uh, but these are, these are entirely predictable within the known biological uh, properties of the Delta variant. And so, um, hey, Doc, are you done with yeah. the screen, Doc? The screen share? Yeah. Oh. Let's see. Um, yeah. So, let me put in. Well, so I, I think you know, for for yeah. uh, for all intents and purposes, I think you know, seventy percent is probably. Uh, I mean, it's still going to be difficult to reach, but it's probably the maximum that we may see uh, in the near future, even if we can get to seventy. And even at 70, uh, based on the model, uh, again, and, and it's, I wanna emphasize that it's a if and then kind of analysis. It's, it's a, you know, it's not a projection. I wanna make that clear to our viewers, but if nothing changes uh, and this variant continues to, to come in, and, and again, you know, that, that's one of, Charlie and I have been talking about, uh, the, the blame has been constantly on the on the residents on the residents that travel to Vegas and come back. But Doc, what is the difference? What is the difference between a resident that is coming back from Vegas or a Vegas resident coming to Hawaii or a California resident uh -huh. coming to Hawaii or a Texas resident coming to Hawaii? You know, again, that that's the problem, right? It's it's all targeted. It's constantly talking about the residents, but your your uh, your presentation makes it quite clear, and I, I think anyone can see that. If you have if you have a tub that's leaking, and, or a bucket that's leaking, and more water is coming in, uh, then it's going to overflow. Uh, so and, well, I'm, and that's I'm, that's a that's my concern. So I'm I'm glad you raised that question because there are differences between the impact of an infected tourist from an infected returning resident. So there's, there's two big differences. One is that tourists um, don't, don't stay here for their entire infectious period. And I think what's the average length of a, of a stay? It's like five days, something like that. Yeah, I'm so, not sure. So they, they're not gonna be spreading their infection the whole time they're infectious to the local residents. Uh, if they if they leave after five days, because you know the whole period is like two weeks, whereas a returning resident they're here probably going to be for at least two weeks, and so all the the entire infectious period is going is is going to be infecting um, the, the local population. The second thing is what's called the contact network. So my models are very simple; they don't include any of the details of the contact network. But pretty much when 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 a tourist gets here, there is only a limited set of, of residents that they get close to, that they could possibly infect. It's you know, maybe mainly workers in the, in the tourism industry, hotel industry, um, other services. So they are not plugged in to the contact network of the resident population the way a returning resident is. So you know, every returning resident who gets here is gonna infect a different set of returning resident of, of locals who are then you know connected dispersed throughout the whole contact network of the residents and so it's kind of there's so there's kind of a bottleneck in terms of who tourists are going to infect and if you protect that interface as it were through getting vaccinated and um, then they can't spread it to the rest of the population but when a returning resident gets here they've got their family all their family's contacts, um, their whole household. And so it's, it's gonna have a higher R value. Um, so this, is not, this has nothing to do with 
the blameworthiness of tourists versus residents. It's just how they fit into the contact network. So it really, it's really important that returning yeah, residents, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no, we're, we're very careful not to, when we discuss the travelers, we call them travelers because they are. I mean, it's residents and visitors that are flying in from areas that may be hot. Vegas is a, is a bad place right now. Yeah. Um, but we had one of our guests, and I can't remember which doctor it was, might have been the work, and I can't remember, he said that they've kind of narrowed down the, the infectious, uh, the, the onset, I guess, of the, or the incubation period to three days with the variant. Have you heard anything about that, that it's pretty much three days after exposure that you start uh, being able to yeah. shed this, vi this variant. Yeah. Yes. I, I read that too. So that's like two days faster than the old yeah. variant. So instead of being five, it's like three. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so this is something that returning residents can do, especially those coming back from Las Vegas is, um, is basically assume you're infected and try to protect everybody around you by by self-quarantining to the extent that you can. Um, and so the, uh, so even if you're vaccinated, so this is, this is a new disturbing data that's come out in terms of asymptomatic infection among even the vaccinated, that there seems to be a, a, a really high rate of, of infection, asymptomatic infection among vaccinated people. You know, so they, the study is just uh, today out of Israel uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. And they're finding that uh, the longer ago that you got the vaccine, the, the, the higher a chance that you could pick up an asymptomatic infection. And so it's not like 90%. No, it's, they said it was the, the number today is 39%. So the key thing is the, the vaccine is like, um, it's protecting your body from the virus. So the virus can get into your respiratory tract and your nose and start replicating, but the antibodies in your body are, are gonna protect it um, from the whole body getting wrecked and from dying to a high degree to, to, sim to simplify it. So if you wanna personally protect yourself from having your health wrecked and having long COVID and, or dying, it's really important to get vaccinated. So, um, the thing I haven't gone into here, so when you, when you said it's, we're probably going to be not be able to get beyond 70% vaccination. So that all depends on what people are carrying around in their minds in terms of the ideas. Um, so I'm hoping that, that all of your good work um, and tonight's show uh, might help people to realize it's important that I get vaccinated. And uh, because if, if, if there's anybody that cares for you, they're not gonna want you to get sick. And if you care about anybody else, you don't want them to get sick. And, um, and so the COVID vac the current vaccines are really good at protecting you from these serious um, life-threatening uh, extent of disease from the, even from the Delta variant. But it's still, um, you know, it's still able to like infect the nose and get to somebody else, even if it, even if you don't even know it's there. So this is what is so strikingly sneaky and, and evil about this coronavirus is, is that it can infect people and they don't even know it. So if you're, if you're monitoring your symptoms to say, you know, I'm not a danger to anybody else, the COVID, the COVID virus has, has basically manipulated that to get to infect people, all right? It, it makes people let down their guard because they, they don't think that they have any symptoms, but they're spewing out the virus. And, and that's why we have a pandemic. It's the unique, it's the unique sneaky um, subterfuge of this virus that has allowed it to become a pandemic is that it, no, people don't even know they have it and they're infecting other people. Hey doc, it's it's after eight. Can we can we keep you for a few more minutes? I just wanted to one of the one of the questions that keep coming up, and and I'm I don't have any children in school. My kids are all old, but um, we are a very short time away from school opening up. Um, many kids are going to be back in classrooms. The under twelve kids who are not eligible for uh, 
for a vaccine are going to be going into an environment uh, which is pretty much 100% unvaccinated environment because none of the kids are going to have uh, been vaccinated. Do you have any thoughts on that? And is that something we, I mean, everyone else on our show is, is being is very concerned about, uh, about this and that it could in fact create a huge outbreak of cases in our state. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, from the numbers that I showed on how, how Delta infectious it is, that's certainly a possibility. The thing is, we know that with the old variants, that schools have been able to successfully open in-person classes and prevent the, the, a, an outbreak of the coronavirus. So we know that it was possible with the old variants. I don't know of any, of any um, case studies where schools have proven that they can do that with the Delta variant. Uh, as far as I as far as I can say, it's an experiment. It's going to be an experiment we we do in our kids to open up in person with this Delta variant because nobody nobody really knows. Nobody has the experience of it. So I, you know, I probably um, there's information from India uh, to see how if they've been able to um, open schools in person safely because um, they had the first experience with Delta, but. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a human experiment that we're doing on our kids. And the only way to know what's going on is to, is to test like crazy. And so we have fine grain day-to-day -day measures of how this experiment is going. And if it goes off the rails, we wanna know as quickly as possible so that we can go to plan B. That's, that, that's my overall picture without you know, a lot of details. Well, you know, Doc, it, it's, it's quite evident that what you just said would have been uh, so-called the magic elixir, right? Just test the heck out of them and just, you know, just basically get it into a cone and just have it come in. I mean, like they say, you know, if, if you're going to get hit, you want to see when it's coming, right? But once we started to see all the rules starting to relax, it was almost this honor system. It was like, okay, we're going to remove the bars from the prison because the prisoners know that they have to serve their time and they won't leave the property. <laughs> well, you know how that goes. <laughs> so that's, that's where we're at right now. We are seeing too uh, alarming rate of uh, youngsters getting infected with the, with, the, with the Delta variant much more than they did with the, uh, the earlier uh, variants or the original virus and i think that is a little concerning because uh these kids are gonna are, are gonna <laughs> it's hard to control them kids in a classroom and and out on the on the yard and and uh i i mean it's a tough it's a tough situation we mm -hmm. want our kids back in school uh in 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 person learning but I mean, right now with the with the numbers rising like this here in hawaii i, I don't know i don't know if that's the right thing I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, so, I mean, the things are, you know, once, once somebody's health is ruined, it's ruined for a long time. Exactly. And in, you know, in, in a matter of months, vaccines will be available for much younger children. Now, if, if people, you know, on mass decide that people that were not wanting to get the vaccine change their minds and we really top off the vaccination rates, that will help enormously. And so just, you know, it, we're impatient to get back to normal. The Delta is not gonna let us do it. We can act like it's normal, but then people are gonna get, be getting massively sick. So um, we just have, we, so I think, I mean, the denial of reality is I think our most dangerous foe. And it's important not to deny any part of the reality. So it's, we don't want to deny that we are freedom loving people, but we also don't want to de deny that we're life loving people. And this virus is, has changed the biology of, uh, of the population and it's making us have to um, have some trade-offs, not forever, but until, um, you know, until we get the population vaccinated. And, uh, I think um, I, I'm going, I would be, bet, bet, I would bet that it, within a certain amount of time, um, kids will be eligible and it will be safe. It'll be shown to be safe for kids, but um, that, that time is not yet. 
So let, let, yeah. me, let me kind of run something past you and, and I want your opinion on it. Is the vaccine and what, from what you know, it, it almost seems as if there's a minute space between the ages of 11 years and 300, and six, 300, and 300 days mm -hmm. instead of 364. 11 years, 300 days, and 12 years old. That 64 days is preventing a child from getting mm. the vaccine because of what? Is it just because studies have shown that they got to be 12? So is it a no. number that's causing the denial of letting them get it if they could get it at 11 and 11 years and 360 days and they just need four more days to go or whatever it may be? Well, and this is the problem with rules and committees. You know, you have to set a number and it can be quite arbitrary. So, you know, you try to set a reasonable number, but still, that, as you're pointing out, there's not much of a huge difference between an 11 and a 12 year old. So, you know, these are problems of bureaucracy. And it's the same thing, you know, when the CDC says, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Well, that, that's such an oversimplified recommendation. There's so, there's so many aspects of the, of the pandemic. So, you know, this, this is how a rule-based society works, how law-based, it has these rules and that are not entirely rational, but are the kind of the best choice. And you could get really complicated rules that would be much more rational, but they'd be impossible to enforce. Mm -hmm. So it's not, this is not an easy one to just fix. <laughs> Sorry, I threw it at you, Doc. No, no. Uh, that's a great question. And I think a lot yeah. of people ask that question, especially the parents of those 11 year, you know, 11 year, 11 month old kids that uh, they want to send them to school, but they want to make sure their kids are safe. And that, that is, uh, that, that's always a problem. Um, I know we, uh, there's just a couple of things. Uh, and I want to go back to the safe travels because, you know, the Olympics, uh, very strict protocols and they're seeing this variant. And again, it just goes to show how contagious and easily transmissible this, uh, this variant is. Imagine if the, the, the Tokyo Olympic Committee utilized Hawaii's safe travel program to screen their Olympic athletes. What do you think <laughs> the result would be? Uh, Delta would take home all the gold medals. <laughs> Either that or they would change the name to the 220, 20 whatever, 220, 221 COVID Olympics. That's what it's going to be called. Yeah. Wow. Well, Doc, I mean, you know, I really, I don't, I want to respect your time. You know, we got Lambda still out there in the wings, uh, making its way across to coming to the United States and that'll be in Hawaii soon. Uh, that's probably another hour show just to talk about Lambda, but uh, I think you hit it on the head talking about the importance of getting vaccinated. Uh, that's really our only weapon right now, uh, aside from strict self-discipline and, and self-responsibility. But uh, any, any closing comments or thoughts for our viewers? And again, we really appreciate your time, my friend. Yeah, well, I, well, I can't believe uh, we, we fi filled up the hour. I was thinking, what am I going to talk about for an hour? <laughs> uh, I, I, I knew, I, I figured one hour would not be enough. But. So I guess the, the thing I didn't get to is the infodemic. All right, parallel to the COVID epidemic is an epidemic of bad information. And so with our... You know, we have the perfect um, transmission system now. Our social media is perfect for viral communication of, of, of info, infodemic viruses, infoviruses. You know, so something doesn't have to be true to get transmitted and to go viral. It just has to get people to forward it, to click it. And so what makes people want to spread information? Well, because it it can fit into something, it can fit into the framework, you know, and basically they, they, can, they agree with it and they want to send it on. So, you know, I'm reminded of the, of the Aesop fable of the fox and the grapes, all right? So this fox is trying to eat some grapes. They look so delicious, it can't reach it. And so it gives up and it says, ah, they were sour anyway, I'm sure. So the, the fox is lying to itself. 
it knows those grapes were really good, but it's trying to tell itself a story that'll make it feel better. All right, so what happens on, a, on, a, on Facebook, on Twitter, when people are transmitting you know, false stories about the virus that, you know, that make them feel good? And you know, th then you get a lot of false stories that are preventing people from getting the, vi getting the vaccine and tragically getting the virus. You see case after case, terrible tragic stories of people that say, you know, I wish I'd gotten vaccinated and they're very, very sick. Um, so what can I say? How do we fight the info infodemic? All right. So we, we each have to, to practice a kind of information hygiene and don't just transmit to somebody else something that fits, you know, what your, um, what your, what you think is, is um, an outrageous thing or whatever it, I would say, you know, and th this is a, this is a tricky business, but I would say, first of all, do your, do your research. And if you see something that, that, you, that looks like you want to transmit to somebody else, do some research on it. See what his fact checking has been done on it. And, and I would say fact check things that you're, that you're um, both comfortable with and uncomfortable with. So we all, it's just like social distancing. You know, we have to practice information hygiene and, and, and really be suspicious of the thing that somebody tweets to you. And don't just take it at face value and send it on. And certainly don't change your, don't act on it based on what it, what it says at face value. Do some digging, dig into it. Because, um, you know, there's um, disinformation. There's professional people, state, state agents cranking out this, this information to try to, uh, um, to, you know, to affect other societies. It's not anymore just person to person. It's becoming exploited just the way that the coronavirus has exploded, exploited our contact networks. The, this infodemic is exploiting our, 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 twit, our Twitter, uh, Twitter networks and our social media networks to spread disinformation and it's killing people. And so I guess it's really important that people um, dig into any information that is that someone is saying that the virus that the vaccines are dangerous it's important to know that the, they're not risk-free it's just that the risk from getting vaccinated is vastly vastly less than uh, the risk from getting covid i mean so you have what 200 million people have gotten vaccinated and there have been some deaths but it's not 600,000 deaths from 40 40 million people being vaccinated so good medicine is a matter of properly assessing risk. That's something I learned from taking care of my dad who was in the, in the medical system off and on quite a bit. That when, if a doctor doesn't balance the risk correctly, they can put them through a procedure that is much riskier than whatever it was supposed to help them with. And so in this case, the, the balance of risk, so the vaccines are not risk-free but they're vastly less risky than getting COVID. And that's really the, the decision that you need to make. So try to properly evaluate the risks. That's the best suggestion I can make to people. Shauna, Kelly Inouye. Um, doc, you don't know who she is. She met you tonight and she just posted, thanks for this important message tonight. I'm going to get vaccinated. See that, that's what, that's what we try to do. Uh, we ain't pushing nobody to get a vaccine, but the facts are the facts. And it's so funny when you talk about disinformation, Doc, because, you know, Charlie and I, we, we, we frequent, frequently get accused of spreading disinformation and fear mongering and scare tactics. And, and uh, I don't know how oh. anyone can dispute. <laughs> oh, it's, it's and not, clueless, and it's, clueless. It's not disinformation because what we spread is disinformation, that information, you know? So that's the kind of information that we spread right now. Yes. <laughs> and Tyson, Tyson says, hold up. Are you saying that all my degrees I got from Google University isn't valid? 
that's it. I want a refund. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, the only thing hard about doing this show is I cannot see every comment because it scrolls so quickly. So I apologize if I miss some of them. Some of them I get to see and it's just awesome. But I do, you know, I want to, and if there's any others that are on here that tonight's show, uh, maybe you were on the fence like Shauna and you decided, hey, you know what? I think it's time to at least seriously consider getting the vaccine. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, give, let's give Shauna a round of applause here for making the decision. I tell you what, there is really no, no other readily available weapon or arsenal that we can, we can do right now uh, to protect us and others, especially with what's going on and what you saw tonight. But anyway, Doc, thank you so much, man. Is there anything else, Doc? I, I, I mean, it's your time, not mine. I can, I, can, I can stay up all night long listening to you, bro. I guess that was the, my most important message was about information hygiene. Because it's really, it's, you know, it's, it's crucial for our society as a democracy. Um, and we have the infodemic is really helping. So the, the, the misinformation is paving the way for coronavirus. All right. First, people get infected with with misinformation about the vaccines and then they get the coronavirus infects them. So it's like, you know, it's like somebody who gets the flu and then that causes them to get bacterial pneumonia. It's like they're working in tandem. So um, just protect yourself on, on both fronts. And so, you know, so these days, you, Google can actually help you get to the scientific literature. So Google Scholar, so a lot of that, you know, it's full of jargon and it's, it's very hard to, to go through, but that's where, I, that's where I turn to. If I wanna see, you know, what's the, what's the lowdown on this, that's where I'll go to. And that's why I think actually, you know, science technology uh, um, education is really important because it helps the individual citizen be able to evaluate science for themselves. And, uh, you know, so this is to do a, a plug for the University of Hawaii system and this is a big important part that it has to play beyond just making you more competitive in the job market. It, it helps that the people you're around are, are scientifically um, educated and can evaluate science for themselves. And you want to be in a population that where the individuals can evaluate science for themselves. And that I think is the, is the most important, actually the most important role of higher education is so that you're living among people that that can that can really figure out what's going on in the science and not get um, not get um, uh, uh, pulled into into false information. And you are one of those experts, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Charlie. Yes, sir. You got a lot, you got a lot on your mind. I can see it, bro. Well, this first of all, Doc, this is the fun part, Doc. This is the fun. That's in your seatbelt. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I first would like to say thank you very much to Dr. Lee Offenberg for joining us tonight. Appreciate um, the very stunning and revealing um, facts about this virus uh, from a mathematical sense. You know, like anything else, if you got hardcore numbers and you know, and, and you know how to how to use those numbers. It it, it will, you know, it, it's it, it will reveal something that you know sometimes it's it's harder to reveal if you're just explaining it in the open. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, to the viewers out there, many have expressed, Uncle Charlie, are you okay? I'm just caught up in deep thought because <laughs> I have been labeled as clueless. <laughs> as you can see, what I've asked is a lot of the questions we've been asking all along because we're dealing with something and every time something morphs into uh, something even stronger and worse than what the original was, you adjust. Just right now, I'll give you a prime example, like the updated fire engines, right? Back in the days when you only had two, three-story buildings, your fire engines didn't have all these hook and ladders. Then as Waikiki started to go up and buildings got taller, you had to adjust. So to fight a fire, what did they do? Boom, they got these mega trucks that had these ladders that can go up 10 stories high. That's just adjusting. And I think what we found out tonight is we need to adjust because if we think that we're gonna fight this virus 
the same way like the regular virus, you're sadly mistaken. And this gentleman that joined us tonight has shown it. And I'm still perplexed over the fact of why didn't individuals in places that could make a difference to help our community, why didn't they go down this path? Because I'm pretty sure this information was always available. So for those of you out there, that's the reason why I look perplexed as well as looking somewhat clueless. But <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Alterberg again. Thank you for Mel? having me. Hope, hope this was valuable. You know, doc, doc, you saw you saw in real time how uh, uh, factual scientific information can can really raise awareness, and we saw it live in color tonight with with, with Shauna and many others. I'm sure that uh, maybe have posted or maybe didn't post, but you know, uh, I, I did want to want to say to our viewers um, today we we had some troll make some nasty comments. And I'm not gonna get into that. I'm not even gonna deal with it. I just wanted to say uh, to our viewers, thank you. You guys responded <laughs> in a way that I, 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 I you, I'm telling, Charlie and I had a little discussion before tonight and I got really emotional because some of you actually posted. And the reason I bring this up doc is because you're responsible for this, that some of you actually posted comments to the effect your show has saved lives. You folks have saved my parents' lives. You guys, tonight we saw again, right in front of us, someone making the decision to get a vaccine, potentially saving their lives. I honestly didn't realize that, that this show and our guests that we've brought on for a year and a half made, created that much of an impact to our viewers that was very evident today. And I just wanted to say on behalf of Charlie, myself, our families, that, that you guys, we love you guys so much. And Doc, for you to spend an hour and 15 minutes or hour and a half of your time where I know you, you, you're a busy guy to come out and share your knowledge, your studies, your research to our viewers so they can get the information they need to make educated decisions. We, we appreciate, Doc. We appreciate you and your organization and, uh, and our viewers. We love you guys so much. I don't know what, what, what more to say other than you know. guys have... Huh? I got to tell you one thing, though, and, and, and sorry for, for interrupting, you know, continue. I've learned tonight, that's why you don't hear me talking numbers, because when this man puts up numbers, it's somewhat intimidating. <laughs> so, so that's why you didn't hear me say any numbers tonight. You stayed away from the number rule. Yeah, and that's why I'm glad you put charts for the Portuguese like myself, that, that we, we don't know how to read, we, we know how to look at pictures. But you, you're, you were very articulate. You were very, you, you, you did it at a level where we understood. And, and the comments speak for itself. Uh, I don't know if you have your, your, your comments rolling, Doc, but uh, if you don't, please go back and check it out afterwards. Uh, you know, I, I just cannot say thank you enough to you and everyone else, viewers especially. You guys are the bomb, came, got our backs. Trolls will be trolls, haters will be haters. At the end of the day, guess what? It's going to be up to all of us to get through this, this crisis. And I, unfortunately, I still think that we got a ways to go. So um, doc, appreciate you. Uh, don't, don't be surprised if, if uh, we be knocking on your door again for a follow-up because um, I think as many of our viewers have said, this is one of the best shows they've ever seen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you doc. Thank you. you guys all. Enjoy yeah. you guys weekends, everybody. Uh, stay safe, please. If you're going to go out this weekend, Wear your mask, social distance, disinfect, wash your hands. Okay, guys. It's, and, a, it's a very, very dangerous time right now. We gotta be safe. And you know, folks, if 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 you're gonna play with numbers, call this guy, have this guy in your corner. <laughs> then at least you can you, you can look at least educated, okay? Because this guy will make you look educated with the numbers that he throws out there. <laughs> and and he has a beautiful yard. Look at that beautiful trees in the background. That's Elima, by the way. Oh, really? On Whoa. Maui. Yulima in the Willy Willy Forest in Wailea 670 in Maui. Right. So for those of you, those of you that want to uh, check out Dr. Lee Altenberg, go to the UH site, Google him up, Google him up, read some of his publications. You guys are going to be impressed. All right, guys, again, I can sit here all night and talk. This was a hell of a show. I love you guys, Doc. Thank you. Stay safe. God bless. We will see you guys. Oh, one real quick. Is a vaccine safe to take while you're pregnant? Somebody just texted me that. From what I know of the data on 
on pregnancy, it's safe. But uh, I'm, I don't have the details on that. I haven't heard of any conditions that you shouldn't take the virus. I take, excuse me, that you shouldn't take the vaccine. Check with your primary care physician or your OBGYN. Yes. They know your body more than we do. Good luck, you guys. God bless. Thank